Hello, my name is Sarah Lovell and I'm the director of the Center for Agroforestry at University of Missouri. This presentation is really just intended to provide a brief overview of the concept of agroforestry, really hoping that it might inspire you to learn more about various different aspects of this concept. So agroforestry may be a completely new term to you. I would not be surprised at all if you've not heard of it before. But if you drink coffee, then you've most likely benefited at some point from a product that comes from agroforestry. In this image, you're looking at a landscape that is one that where coffee is produced. Some of those the plants in the foreground here are actually coffee shrubs. And you can see that it's on this very diverse landscape. It's not a system where it's just one focused on just one crop, but instead a lot of different species. And so we would consider that an agroforestry landscape. You might not even be familiar exactly with how coffee is grown, but the coffee cherries, as they're called in the stage, grow on kind of a shrubby plant in tropical regions. And these are basically, you know, the shrubby plants, they can be that they can be grown in a monoculture. If you look at the, the figure on the left hand side near the bottom, you can see, <clears throat> you can see what a, an unshaded monoculture would look like. So that would be just a setting that has coffee alone. So that would not be considered agroforestry because it's only one crop. So that's why we call it a monoculture. But the other systems where they're integrating different species, those are considered agroforestry. So those overstory trees, the ones that provide shade for coffee, they offer you know, a better coffee product because the coffee grows well in the shade. And they themselves, those other trees, can provide fruits and firewood, depending on what, what species you have in there. Another type of agroforestry that we see often in tropical areas is called a home garden. These are also very diverse types of garden settings that have different species that are designed to produce food products and a wide range of other materials, oftentimes in a really small condensed area. And so a lot of times the products are used as, an, as a subsistence item for the family or the gardener who's producing that, or they might be shared within those communities. This figure actually shows just how diverse you can have a system here. So many different products can be provided in such a small space. Here they're showing coconut and breadfruit, avocado, banana, papaya, coffee too, in that understory again. So you can just really see how diverse the system is. And even at those lowest levels, you can have vegetable crops and spice crops in addition to the tree and shrub species. So let's go ahead and provide a specific definition for agroforestry. This is, occurs when trees and shrubs are deliberately integrated with crops or livestock. So there are those two elements where it has the woody species, the trees or the shrubs, and integrating those with a productive component, the crops or the livestock. And so the, the word agroforestry comes from agriculture, so agro, and that being the crop portion, and then forestry, of course, is the, the tree and shrub species. And you can see in this image just how many different types of practices can actually be included under the umbrella term agroforestry. And we'll go through those a little bit more in a minute. In North America, Agroforestry has also been practiced for many, many years, and Native Americans actually practiced a form of agroforestry in gathering uh, uh, fruits and nuts and different products from the forest setting and even integrating those with different types of production components. Today, we're really working hard to to understand those practices, but also to value and respect them. And we'll call those traditional ecological, call this traditional ecological knowledge. This is important information that can be provided by indigenous groups from their traditional cultural heritage. 
In the U.S., we've also seen a situation in which agroforestry was really brought into some of the some of the institutions and even into the government. So in the in the 1930s, there were dust storms. You probably heard of the Dust Bowl that occurred in the Great Plains during that area because m the soils were uncovered and there were wind storms across those Great Plains zones. And so this inspired what they call the Prairie States Forestry Project, which was an enormous effort to integrate wind breaks, and that being an agroforestry practice, integrate those across vast areas of land. In fact, 18,000 miles of trees were planted on 30,000 different farms from North Dakota into Texas. Just imagine that, that there are 30,000 different landowners, different farms in which they were able to integrate this certain type of practice to alleviate the specific problem. They did a lot of work in trying to understand how to prioritize where those windbreaks would go because there was a big investment related to that. So they took resource maps and combined data on things like soils, the existing vegetation, in those areas. The wind direction, of course, was very important. And then they were able to take that and kind of layer that together to make a good assessment of where to focus those efforts. Then they also had propaganda materials, like you can see in the item on the right-hand side there, to really encourage landowners to adopt windbreak practices. So in recent years, temperate agroforestry, so that being agroforestry in the, the temperate region as opposed to tropical region, the focus has really been on specific recognized practices. And we'll go through each one of these, but you can see that there are a diversity of different ones ranging from civil pasture to wind breaks, which is what we talked about in the Prairie Strait States project, to things like alley cropping and we'll go through each of these. So among these five key practices, alley cropping is taking rows of trees and putting those rows of trees at a spacing that allows the grower to actually put a different crop in between those rows. So a companion crop is put in the alleyways. So this differs from just an orchard, say of a, a nut crop where the trees are planted in rows this one differs because now you have a, another crop in between. So in this case, we're looking at Chinese chestnut grown for the nut itself on the trees. And then in between that is grown wheat. And you can see that there's enough area, enough space between there to grow and harvest wheat as an additional product. Another practice is called forest farming. In this situation, we start with an existing forest and the goal is to actually integrate other types of high value specialty crops. And specialty crops are those crops that aren't the typical large scale commodity crops that we work with. So these can be grown actually in the shade of the forest canopy. And many of these prefer shade. Things like mushrooms can be grown in the shade and ginseng. And there are other products that grow well in, the, in those low light conditions. So if a landowner has a forest, this is a great opportunity to add another crop, add another item that can go into the marketplace. A popular practice in much of the U.S. is called the riparian buffer. A riparian zone is a, a water zone connected to water. So these plantings are designed to protect those water resources. They protect streams and lakes and they help to capture some of the sediment that's coming from the fields, or they can capture nu nutrients, fertilizers that would otherwise go into the water, or other types of contaminants. So they're keeping that water cleaner and healthier, improving the water quality overall. That's the primary purpose of those. Civil pasture integrates another element. In silvopasture, we're taking the combination of trees and forage and combining in livestock. So livestock would maybe typically be, be working in pastures. We might have them in pastures. And in this case, we're adding trees to provide shade for the livestock. In many cases, they 
the animals perform better. They're more comfortable in a shade environment and they can have better performance in terms of gaining weight or producing milk. The benefit to the landscape is that the animals can help with grazing, grazing the plant material, vegetation in the understory and supplying nutrients for that landscape. Then windbreaks that we talked about a little bit earlier are often integrated in areas where there are other crops being grown or other practices. So these would include rows of trees and shrubs and they're specifically designed to protect the soil or the crops or the livestock from damage from wind. In the upper picture, you can see a newly established windbreak situation where the trees are very small at that point and this type of program can actually be supported through, through government efforts. And again, those trees will grow into a nice thick windbreak that will protect nearby crops or a homestead even. In the lower picture, we're looking at a situation where the windbreak is serving as a mitigation opportunity to reduce the odors that are coming from a confinement operation. So I talked a little bit about those five practices that have been recognized for a number of years. Recently, we've started to emphasize this sixth key practice. This is the urban food forest. And this is a situation where we're taking a range of different plant produ food producing plants. They're perennial plants, which means they, they are still remain there from year to year, unlike annual plants. This combination of trees and shrubs can really improve the sustainability and the resilience of urban communities. You can see in that image in the upper portion that this type of system can have a wide range of species. It's similar to a home garden that we saw in the tropical regions. And along the bottom, you can see some of the, just the wide range of edible products that can come from a system like that. In urban settings, we're often constricted with the space that we have. So these types of different multi-layered plantings can help to bring in more diversity into that system, allow for more, a great variety of different products, even within a small space, because now we have different layers that we're working in. And so you can see where the, the tree canopies and the shrub canopies connect with each other above the ground, but also below the ground, they're filling different niches in that below ground space. So you can have a wide range of things. You can have taller trees that provide shade and are more of a, a tree canopy. Those might be nut producing trees. We might have pecan trees in that zone or black walnut trees. Then we have lower trees that can actually adapt to some shade in that setting and shrubs as well and a lot of berries that we like to eat are grown on shrubs that can exist in this type of situation. Finally I'm going to talk about uh, a really recently emerging interest area and this is really focusing on the food production aspect and not just growing food in the alleyways between the tree crops but actually focusing specifically on trees and shrubs that produce foods themselves. So might be trees that produce nuts, shrubs that produce berries. Again, we'll call these specialty crops because they are crops. They're harvested and can be sold into marketplaces, but they're not the conventional types of crops that we're used to that are grown in very large scale monoculture situations. This is similar to the urban food forest concept in the layering of it. We have this multi-layered system where we have larger overstory species. We have mid-range species that can adapt to a bit of shade. And then we can have shrubs in the understory underneath the trees. In this situation though, we're talking about something that could be done as a commercial production and at the scale of commercial production and thinking about what it would take to manage this type of system and thinking about mechanical harvesting so that it could be done at a larger scale. 
So in this case, the, the trees and shrubs are grown in rows. They're still integrated. You still have a mix of different species, but by growing them in rows, you can have other crops grown in between, and it's easier for management activities. This type of what we'll call production agroforestry is really a different type of alternative to agriculture altogether. It's a, a whole different view of thinking about our food production systems. In this figure, what we're looking at, on the left-hand side, we're looking at productivity. So we'll say that's productivity in terms of the yield of the, the products that you're pulling off of that area. That in connection with, along the bottom, the resilience or ecological complexity, so the diversity of different species. Typically, we see an inverse relationship between these. So as productivity increases, where we have, we're focusing more on the, the grain, the yield of what we're taking off, we are reducing the complexity considerably. So in this situation where we're looking at annual crops, like corn, it's very productive in terms of what the yield can be, but it's not at all um, complex in terms of the diversity of species. There's just one. And you can see along this trajectory, at the bottom we have forest, a forest system, a natural forest system, which is very complex, it's very resilient, but there's the productivity in terms of yielded products that you can take out of that and consume is, is relatively low. And along this trajectory, we have other things like orchards and typical agroforestry that might include a system that has a windbreak along with a crop. With the production agroforestry system, we're looking at an opportunity to move off of that tra trajectory, to move beyond that. It won't maybe be as productive in terms of the calories produced as an annual cropping system. And it won't be as complex as a forest by any means, but by moving above that, the line of that trajectory, it could be a better performing system when we consider the range of benefits, the range being the yield of products in addition to other environmental benefits that we're gonna gain from that type of system. Look at the range of different products that can be produced in something like that. We're seeing products like elderberry, pecan, juneberry, we have persimmons, aronia berry, and pawpaw, and these are just some of the examples. These are actually species that are all native to the Midwest where we're growing some of these systems. So they were originally grown in, or they were originally um, produced in this area in natural systems and now can be considered for some sort of commercial production. This example shows how we can combine these two concepts, the productive agroforestry concept with a more conventional type of cropping system, in this case looking at corn grown in the field, and on the left hand side we're looking at a windbreak that's made up of species, these specialty crop species that produce harvestable food products, the Chinese chestnut, hazelnut, and a currant is gonna produce a berry that's edible. So you can really combine these different pieces and gain a lot of benefits in terms of environmental services, ecosystem services that, that provide improvements in, in the, the quality of the environment and help to offset some of the negative impacts of other types of cropping systems. So just as a reminder, agroforestry, by definition, it's gonna require an interaction between different species. It's gonna have the trees and the shrubs and those interacting with the crops or the livestock. So we have these many different combinations because we have different species of trees. We also have different species of the crop and different species of what the livestock could be. In reality though, when we have this very diverse system, we end up with a lot of different interactions between species because it draws in insects and reptiles and a lot of beneficial species, wildlife that can, can benefit from this type of system. So that's just a basic overview of agroforestry to kind of set the context for understanding this type of system.
there's so much more depth in what we do so much more depth in understanding all of those different practices and particularly in understanding the wide range of benefits that those provide so i encourage you to visit the center for agroforestry.org website and start to look at a lot more of those resources and we're going to have this set up so there are different opportunities for landowners or researchers or students we have programs graduate programs for students that have a lot of online opportunities to take coursework to obtain either a master's degree in agroforestry or a certificate in agroforestry. So that's all I have. Thank you.